I just love luxury boats. I make a lot of sacrifices just for the pleasure of spending a few days a year on these heavenly boats that sail the seven seas. But the one I'm on today will give me much more than a voyage. It will open the doors of paradise for me. I'm in Polynesia on board the Paul Gauguin. I boarded this impressive vessel in Tahiti. Exhausted from the flight, I dropped right off to sleep. When I awake, the miracle has taken place. I am sailing on the turquoise waters of a Polynesian lagoon. Pure bliss. Before 50 years, luxury was caviar, glass of champagne, and uh, perhaps a butler in uh, white gloves. But uh, we cannot consider as luxury today only this. So there are many, many more things that need to be taken in consideration. For example, I'm here for seven years and uh, uh, I have a lot of love and passion for French Polynesia. Uh, even when I'm at home, I'm thinking of the day when I will come back to continue working on Paul Gauguin. Working here is also kind of luxury, even it is really a very serious job. Seven years in Polynesia. Usually I'm a bit nosier, but my little questions for the captain will just have to wait. I'm here for only seven days, and there's so much to discover, beginning with the decks of the Paul Gauguin itself. There's a warm, friendly atmosphere around the pool, and the chairs and lounges certainly are elegant and comfortable, but this is normal luxury. Now, on deck number four, where the reception is, we have a change of scenery, an evocation of the voyage of the explorer Bougainville, a tribute to the Maori culture and to Paul Gauguin. There's no two ways about it. The Tahitian women that grace Gauguin's most beautiful paintings are still just as alluring. A tender of the Paul Gauguin drops us off on a motu, a little island dotted with palm trees in the lagoon of Bora Bora. Now, there's no room for doubt. I'm really in Polynesia. This man in his Hawaiian shirt is Steve, our cruise director. And believe it or not, he's hard at work right now. Hello. Bonjour. Is everybody having a good time? Yes? Très bien? Good food? Yeah, today is our beach barbecue day. They can chill out. We don't push them to do activities over here. And the, the barbecue is, is a world-class barbecue. We have an open bar. We have a floating bar in the water. Uh, the waiter's pulling the bar along behind them so they can snorkel and have a glass of champagne at the same time. You can't get much more luxury than that over here. It's a destination that people wanted to have come to all their lives. So, yeah, it's, it's a big luxury destination. You can't beat here in Taha today. The, the water, there's 14 shades of turquoise in the water. You don't get that anywhere else in the world. It's, it's, it's just natural luxury. It's natural beauty in this side of the world. I would have gladly stayed a little longer on the beach, but it's time to get back to the boat. The voyage is just beginning. I'm sure there'll be other idyllic stopovers. In the meantime, follow me. I'll let you take a peek at my cabin. I can hardly believe I had breakfast this morning on my balcony overlooking the lagoon of Bora Bora, the pearl of the Pacific. 
the subtle glowing fabrics, the exotic woods. It's not a lavish decor, but rather it radiates a discreet charm. Flat screen TV, DVD player, mini bar, a perfectly appointed stateroom, up to the standing of the boat, and a queen size bed all to myself. Now that's luxury, especially when I think of the sofa bed back in my Paris studio apartment. Plus a butler at my beck and call. Well, he does take care of several cabins, but he's always prompt to fulfill my least desire. What should I expect from the butler? Basically all the needs like the, their excursion, dinner reservations, in-suite dine-in, if they want to have breakfast, lunch or dinner. Looking after the needs like uh, when they send something for laundry and shoe shine. Oftentimes they ask as well to have their uh, luggage unpacked when they arrive and when they leave um, we pack their luggage for them. 19 square meters. All the staterooms of the Paul Gauguin are similar to mine. All? Except the large owner's suite, which I was able to see with the complicity of my butler. 50 square meters. Living room, bar, dining room, separate bedroom. It's so vast, comfortable, and lavishly equipped that you might almost forget you were on a boat. The sun is setting on the Paul Gauguin, which is anchored for the night in the lagoon of Bora Bora. For one evening, the boat has become a floating garden. The passageway leading to the lounge is strewn with flowers, hibiscus, frangipani, orchids, birds of paradise, bougainville, and of course, tiari flowers. Women from the island, seated right on the floor like at the local market, are making garlands and crowns of flowers. I walked around all evening with my crown on my head and a little tiare flower tucked behind my right ear, which in Polynesia means I'm available. There were some handsome officers in uniform, as well as some attractive Polynesians, but no, 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 don't insist. My lips are sealed. I've decided to make the most of the boat this morning. I'm up early and have breakfast in the veranda restaurant. There aren't many people up and about yet, either in the restaurant or the lounges. So I go to visit the spa. Plush atmosphere, fragrant aromas. A massage with essential oils is just so tempting.
I have to confess, when I see the warm, copper-colored skin adorned with tattoos of these beautiful wahine, I feel a twinge of jealousy. But just you wait, a few days of working on my tan, and then I'll be back. To make up for it, I need to visit the boutique. I happen to notice some lovely jewelry with black pearls, and I have to get a guidebook of French Polynesia. Believe it or not, I left Paris without knowing exactly where I was going. In a way, insouciance is a luxury. We have several different itineraries, the Marquesas, the Cook Islands, the Tuamotus. We often get repeat passengers because they like the service on board and the friendly professional attitude of the crew. That's what makes for the luxury of our ship the very top quality service. The Paul Gauguin has weighed anchor and is heading for our next port of call. As a special favor, the captain has invited me up to the bridge to watch the maneuvers as we arrive. All these screens, it's quite impressive. In the atmosphere, you could hear a pin drop. I have to sit in the corner and keep quiet, which is not easy since I'm usually so talkative. We soon come into view of Muria. It's a glorious sight and I'm, well, speechless. waters, wherever we come, we are the only vessel in the bay. For the guests, there is no queuing. They don't need to wait long waiting, long, uh, long queues uh, on the pier. Wherever they go, they can meet people, they can talk with them, uh, locals, uh, everybody's friendly, and they feel already luxury. They certainly enjoy going on the top of the mountain, hiking, snorkeling, diving, uh, and uh, it's all luxury for me. So uh, not only uh, food, service, friendliness of the crew, but also the area. The captain has dropped anchor at the mouth of Opunou Bay. The sky is dark with clouds. Well, you don't get such lush vegetation without a little rain. Some passengers are off to do some jogging. Others head for the marina that is open for business in the stern for a dive. When you look at the bay here at Opunohu, you can easily imagine that Captain Cook had pretty much the same view when he discovered it. It really hasn't changed much since that time. Laurent is right. The view is stunning, not to mention the seabed he's about to offer to the passengers. And it's a real luxury to be able to reach these spots in 10, 15 minutes. Spots where you can see manta rays, hammerheads, sharks, eagle rays, all this practically unspoiled marine life.
don't look for me among these divers. I know they're about to experience an unforgettable adventure, but I'm too much of a scaredy cat. While waiting for my diving friends to resurface, I'm going to try out the pool and the deck chairs to each his own adventure. The Paul Gauguin is the only luxury cruise ship to sail the French Polynesian islands year-round. The quality of the service. There are 217 crew members for 332 passengers. The beauty of the landscapes. I can see why some passengers come back time and time again. Certain passengers come back to do the same trip three or four times, one-week cruises, like the Society Island trip. They come back because of the service on board, and also they meet up with certain crew members they like to talk with. So, in effect, many cruise passengers are repeaters. They also choose our boat because every day they can discover a new island and sites that are, of course, simply magnificent. The destinations, the service, the staterooms. So far, the Paul Gauguin has a perfect score. But to make it onto my list of favorite luxury boats, the cuisine has to pass my proof of the pudding test. The veranda, comfortable and bathed in sunlight, is one of the ship's two restaurants. But this evening, I'm invited to dine at the Etoile, and that's where I'll hand down my verdict. The idea or philosophy behind this restaurant is to work with a gentleman by the name of Jean-Pierre Vigato, who owns a Michelin two-star restaurant in Paris called Apicius. And between the ship and him, they create a degestation menu here on board the ship for the passengers to try, which offers an upscale service. On board, we're able to create and be creative. The chef, um, his assistants, um, are able to look at trends in the industry, look at food, look at what's available internationally that we can have imported into French Polynesia, and we're allowed to be able to create based on season, based on availability, things along those lines to create top quality menus. The Etoile is about to open. The waiters are briefed with the last minute information on the dishes being offered for dinner. Then they take care of a few final details. On the deck above, the crew in the veranda has set up a few tables out on the deck for a bistro dinner under the star-splashed sky of the Southern Hemisphere. Back in the Etoile, it's eight o'clock. The first diners are arriving and they're greeted by the Gogin, the Polynesian hostesses in charge of entertainment on board.
only a few steps away, the galley crew shifts into high gear. We'll put some garnish for the veal chop and uh... Uh, we do a lot with local fish, actually. We're very, very lucky here that we have all local fish, like yellowfin tuna, wahoo, mahi-mahi. Once a cruise, we have moonfish. We're uh, going to serve lobster. The first night, we have foie gras. We have nice foie gras in uh, La Veranda. So, um, yeah, I, I, will, I will assume it is very luxurious, the food we do here on board. Um, so actually, that's my favorite uh, product to work here in Trans Polynesia. We try to incorporate as much as possible um, stuff from the, the local farmers, coconuts, mangoes, uh, pineapples, uh, watermelon. It's all local fruit that we get here on board, so we try to do as much as possible with that, also for the dessert side. Upon leaving the restaurant, I get a sudden craving for a Mai Tai, the famous Polynesian cocktail. But the bar is empty, not a waiter or passenger in sight. I discover them all in the stern, celebrating the close of the cruise. As I do at the end of each voyage, I take out my red Moliski notebook to jot down the highlights of the trip. The outstanding memory of this cruise? The image of a dazzling white ship slipping through the turquoise waters, and the warm welcome that continues to nourish in each of us the myth of the Polynesian paradise.